Hey. Uh, I hope it's a useful talk. Um, that'd, that'd be nice. My name is Chris. Uh, I'm the creative director and artist at Red Hook Studios and worked on Darkest Dungeon. And uh, I wanted to start really quick by just saying it's a very uh, humbling experience to be able to stand up here. I've learned a lot from GDC and especially from a lot of people that I see in the audience. Um, there are people that I look up to, so hopefully I can kind of give something back. Um, okay, so enough kissing ass. Uh, <laughs> So after three years working on Darkest Dungeon from like uh, Tyler Sigmund and I and, and a bottle of scotch in my living room uh, through all the way to early access and into finishing, um, this idea kind of took hold, hold in my mind. Essentially that it, development is a lot like being in a, in a dungeon crawl. You um, form a party of skilled adventurers. You equip yourself with the best gear, you know, for us like workflow, methodology, competencies, great ideas. And then you basically plunge headlong into this like sprawling abyss of uncertainty for like the next couple years of your life, running out of money, ruining your relationships, and, and all the rest of it. It's uh, <laughs> what's that? Yeah, too soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's going better. It is. <laughs> um, development it, 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 for all of you guys. You guys know this. It, it's um, it's uh. It can be paralyzing because you're faced with making like constant choices with consequences you don't never fully really understand until it's it's too late. And this, the landscape is always changing, and you're always operating with imperfect information, essentially. And I have come to believe that based on my experience on this game, if you go into this development dungeon um, without a strong creative vision for your game, you're essentially going in torchless. So, what is creative direction? Um, it, I think it's a lot of things to a lot of people. Uh, you could call it like the thematic and conceptual framework of the game. You could call it the, the DNA that runs through all the sort of soft sciences, you know, narrative, game design, art, music, audio. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very nebulous and amorphous concept, and I think a lot of times it gets, um, it gets ignored for that reason or not talked about in, uh, in, in practical terms. Um, I think on big projects, you know, when you get face to face with sort of the realities of development, the pillars and the vision documents, they just live on the drive somewhere and because there's no time to go back to that stuff. It doesn't, it's not relevant anymore. And on a smaller project, you're like, well, maybe I don't need it because our game's about jumping. So let's just make the jumping really good. Um, but I, I respectfully disagree. I think that the misconception that it's a, a nebulous and intangible notion um, is, uh, is a missed opportunity for, for indie developers. Um, for us, it was a practical tool. It was something that we consulted and referred to constantly throughout our development, and it, and it served us really well. We're small teams. Uh, we don't have a lot of money when we get started. Um, we can't afford to just arbitrarily bloat scope or like add parkour on Sunday morning to the game. Just, uh, it just it doesn't, it doesn't work for us. I think that um, we have to be more focused and uh, deliver tighter um, experiences by necessity. And in order to do that successfully, we need to make sure that we align all the elements in our game um, to deliver on those on those thematic beats, or we lose we risk like losing our way in development. For us on this game, um, what am I? 38, 39, I, pushing 40. Um, <laughs> The opportunity cost was extremely high. So actually before Tyler and I kicked off the game, both of us had had job interviews and, and there were offers on the table. Um, I have a wife and children and a mortgage and um, an iPad now. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it costs a lot and, and it's a huge risk um, when you're at that, that sort of stage in your life. So for me, it was really important to clearly understand the game we were going to make so that I didn't wake up one morning like eight months later completely depleted of my career's worth of savings and wonder like, wait a second, what is this game actually about? Um, and, and so we invested early and intensely in clearly understanding uh, the game's creative direction. And we looked back on it you know, at every sort of decision point. Um, we've gotten a lot of great feedback on, uh, on Darkest Dungeon, a lot of really positive comments, which are awesome, about how the atmosphere and the thematics all sort of like, all the features funnel in together to deliver this sort of singular experience. And that's great, but it wasn't, it wasn't by accident. Um, it was basically a function of how we approached looking at the game. So consider this like horrible looking tree. 
in the soil you put all your ideas and, and your inspirations and your influences. So like classic CRPGs and comic books and um, sad music and HP Lovecraft and just the, the earth, you know, that, that the game is going to kind of grow out of. And um, through a process of like debate and discussion, you arrive at like the trunk of the game. The, 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 I'm going to skip ahead here. There we go. Um, the, the clearly defined vision that's going to create a framework for you to move forward. And, and from that trunk, the branches grow out, all the dif different disciplines. So design can head off in its area and face its own challenges. Art can do the same, audio, writing. But if you trace them back far enough, they all share an ancestry, which I think looking at the project this way gave us a really um, great place to, to start. And uh, no matter what challenges we face later, we could always come back to this, this trunk that we built. Um, a sort of a clearly defined and articulated vision statement for the game. Um, we did this a couple of different ways. The old uh, collect a bunch of reference art, put it on an image, a classic, classic move. Um, but you know, <laughs> putting a, like annotating it with what about those images is really important. I think because it, it's not enough just to stick a picture somewhere. Um, we had a lot of conversation and debate. We stress tested what we felt like the game would be about and how the game would handle certain problems as they popped up. And we ended up with this uncompromising, gothic roguelike, low fantasy, Lovecraftian um, adventure uh, that challenges players to make the best of a bad situation and make decisions with permanent consequences um, with imperfect information. And that really became the sort of the core vision for the game, and, and everything was routed through that. And I, I wanted to point out, I think, the, the love child metaphor, thanks Jeff for clarifying what that actually is. Um, you know when you're like, oh, you're, my game is X meets Y? Um, for us it became like XCOM meets Dark Souls. I think that's nice to arrive at at the end of the day after you've gone through a more exhaustive process of understanding what it is you're trying to make. But if you start from there, I think it's really reductive. And I think that you risk, like if, if that's your internal mantra is XCOM meets Dark Souls, it's not specific enough because you're not saying what about XCOM you're taking and leaving and what about Dark Souls you're taking and leaving. It's just up to personal interpretation. And I guess that's what I'm really driving at is that when you settle on a creative direction for your game, it cannot be subject to a personal interpretation. It needs to be strong enough to exist on its own. So I did this drawing of Batman. Um, <laughs> I think what worked really well for us by defining this vision for the game, repeatedly articulating it, and, and actively looking for ways to involve it in, in our development process, it, it kind of it became its own entity. We externalized it. Darkest Dungeon became a team member. You know, it wasn't um, what I thought was cool or, or what Tyler thought would work. It, the game was a part of our team, and it had its own likes and dislikes and things that it wanted to be and things that it, it didn't need, um, like parkour. So it's a lot like, uh, you know, Batman and Bruce Wayne. The creative director is a man. He can be, or a woman, obviously. Um, it can be sort of swayed by shifting trends. You can wake up one morning after you, you know, play a great round of Fallout 4 and now you want to have power armor in your racing game. Um, you're, you're vulnerable to these things as a person just by the nature of, especially a creative person, right? We're very easily attracted to neat ideas. But the creative direction for a game has, has to be a symbol. It has to be like immutable and powerful and, and outside of yourself. And Batman's really cool. I could have chosen a, a different superhero, but it wouldn't have been a great creative choice given the talk subject matter. Um, so yeah, essentially, you, you, the thing has to be strong enough to live on its own and fight crime. Um, so being, you know, moving into production with, with the confidence of what we, we knew what we wanted to make um, led to some really interesting choices. So what I thought I would do is demonstrate the practical application of creative direction by just sort of selecting a few sort of key examples. Like I said, it was, it was literally something we talked about all the time, but um, the art style, the, the overall presentation of the game, the writing style and the lore, um, some marketing, um, some, some game design stuff, uh, all of these things were really like big sort of home runs, I think, for, for our creative direction. Excuse me. When we first started, Pixel art was hot, and it was only getting hotter, and you could get a lot of attention by virtue of simply being a pixel art game. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's a case to be made for, like, the irony of cute pixel characters suffering horrible depression and syphilis in a dungeon. Like, that's kind of funny, right? There's, there's something there. Um, but uh, 
It, it, un, ultimately, we looked at it, but it, uh, it communicated the wrong things. It led out with this idea of retro and charming. And even though we were sort of a retro-inspired kind of RPG, um, we couldn't lead out with that um, rose-colored nostalgia and, and cuteness. It actually um, it flew in the face of what we were trying to accomplish. We needed something like really awful and depressing um, to really just hammer that horrible stuff home. Um, so heavy blacks, you know, came into play. We started looking at a lot of comic books and, and, and how to deliver on, on that vibe. And the looseness of the art uh, really reinforced this idea of imperfection. Your heroes are imperfect. Um, the, the information you're getting for your decision making is imperfect. Imperfection is a huge theme in our game. And it was great to give that like a visual personification so that it's literally there. Even if you're not consciously aware of it when you're playing, it's one of those things that uh, it creeps up on you and you understand it without necessarily knowing it consciously. So I think that was a good choice. Um, and the big win for me is that if I can be loose and sloppy and people still think it's cool, then I can get more done faster, um, which is great, because there's only one of me. <laughs> um, the other, uh, the other sort of assumption when you go in to make like a, an RPG, especially a turn-based one, is that the um, the top-down ISO Diablo or classic, you know, Final Fantasy grid cam is usually the default assumption when you describe a game like this to someone. But we ended up with this weird side-scrolling thing. You're always moving left to right, um, and the reason was because you know, as you can see, we did some exploration even after sort of getting some real solid wins on the art style. You can see it's starting to creep in over there. Um, we tried to make it work with this sort of operating under the assumption that we had to do this. Um, but the more we got into it, we realized that the wide angles and the sort of godlike overview robbed the game of that claustrophobic tension that we felt like was so important. We wanted you down in the dungeon with your characters. We don't want you standing up above, like, you know, the Lord kind of looking down with this wide panoramic view. Um, it lost its sense of intimacy and a lot of the intensity. And also, our game is about the psychological ramifications of adventuring, and that's the characters. It's not the environment. So it's less about dungeon layout and more about who's in the dungeon. So again, that was an argument to be made for, for getting nice close in on those characters. Um, and it's also really hard to relate to the top of someone's head. So you know, having nice side view characters gives you something that's a little bit more interesting to look at, and you can kind of attach yourself to the look and feel of the character. And again, another big win is that it's the same set of assets as combat. So we didn't have to JRPG to a battle cam and, and again, imply bigger spaces. Um, and as a result, the game feels very, um, you're very wrapped up in it as you're playing it. The, uh, the writing, um, a big assumption, I think, too, that, that we sort of wrestled with is that, you know, when you make an RPG, usually there's got to be, like, dwarves and elves that fought, like, 10,000 years ago, and then there's a chosen one thrown in there at some point. Maybe there's a life tree. I don't know. Collect a few elements. But it's always, like, very exhaustively spelled out, and it, uh, quite frankly, it kind of bores me to tears sometimes, and I, and I kind of skip through a lot of the quests. I'm like, do you want the wolf pelts? Like, yes or no? <laughs> I just, I just want to get another sword, man. Um, so we felt like for our game, though, um, imperfect information. Again, we don't want to spell out the story. We, we want to sort of suggest that it's there and create this, this fog around the player um, to deliver on this like Twilight Zone uncertainty that I think is, is really important. And it features in a lot of Lovecraft stuff. You only get a keyhole glimpse into these awful horrors. And if they were to be described exactly, it actually does them a disservice. Um, so we, we went a different direction. Um, we tried to tell the story as much in the panels as in the gutters. Like I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys read comics, and, and your brain interpolates what's happening between the panels in the, in the white space in between. And so that gives you um, like a point of contact as the consumer of the product to get invested, to, to use your own imagination to fill in those gaps. And we felt like that would be um, it would pair nicely with the comic book style art, and um, it would allow people to sort of integrate themselves into the fiction. And it means that we don't have to write a novel, which is a huge win. Um, the writing style was a big risk for us as well because, you know, the game uses a lot of uh, really antiquated verbiage, if you will. Um, and it was really a way of us honoring the source material. We felt like we couldn't decouple the, the Lovecraftian overwrought tonality um, from the actual 
um, thematic influences. Like I felt like they were they were really enmeshed. And so to try and tell a Lovecraft style story without that terminology, that phrasing, that turn of phrase um, would would rob it of something inherently that it needed. Um, but it was a risk as far as localization goes, and uh, and we were worried that um, people just wouldn't like it or or wouldn't get it. Um, but that was a risk we were willing to take because we felt like it honored the creative direction of the game much more. And, and again, yeah, horror thrives in the absence of certainty. So the dark places of your imagination, that's where kind of fear and concern settle in. And any time you can play that, pay that out in a, in a horror game, I think you're, you're doing well. So we've looked at a few of these like uh, soft science areas where, where the creative direction was important. That's kind of low-hanging fruit because I think when people talk about creative direction, they immediately associate it with art and, and that kind of thing. But we used it actually as a, as a razor when it came to, to features as well. Um, we really tried to ask the game essentially what it wanted, what it needed to be able to pay off its identity. Um, so for instance, um, a gear system is a popular thing to have in an RPG. It's usually what drives the player experience. They want to uh, you know, upgrade their stuff and get new loot. Um, but it's extremely, extremely costly. And, and we have a small team, obviously, and limited resources. And we had to really ask ourselves, is this something, is this a road we want to go down? Does this actually serve the creative direction of the game? And, and, and the answer was no. Um, our game is about the sword arm, not the sword. It's about the person who's wearing like the armor, not like the, a number of upgrade gems on the armor. Those games are great. I love those games. But that's not this game. And I think understanding what game we were making really helped us make these decisions and, and really never look back. Um, so we used it as a razor to measure the relative value and importance of many, many features. Like you'll notice there's no crafting system. Um, we, so we, we reduced it down to like two inventory slots, but then we blew out the number of items that were there because we recognized the value in having you know, collectible loot. It's great. It's part and parcel of the experience, but it shouldn't play lead guitar in this game. It, it's the bass or even just the little dude with the shaker in the back, you know? Um, it applies to marketing, too. We, trailers, you know, when, when we were first getting started, I did a lot of research um, into sort of how game trailers should be constructed, and the conventional wisdom was that they need to be fast, punchy, there needs to be flying text. I think you're supposed to, in, like, um, announce a new game mechanic every, like, five seconds, or there's, it's all, you can find it on Google. We didn't do any of that. We, it just, because it didn't, it didn't align with the mood and tone of the game. So our trailers are, um, are too long, they're too slow, and they deliver feeling over function. But ultimately, they were really successful precisely for those reasons. They, they stood out from a lot of other marketing materials because of their commitment to the game's identity. They felt like they were an extension of the game as opposed to something that was slapped together after the fact. And I think that's really important because what's a marketing material but like an on-ramp, right? You're trying to pull people in. And if you're pulling them in in a slapdash way that doesn't feel genuinely connected to the product itself, um, I think you're just you're on-ramping them onto a gravel road somewhere. So the last example I want to bring up uh, is uh, related to game design. Generally, this is a sound principle, right? Like, don't just take away shit from people who've worked really hard in your game to earn it, right? That's kind of a no-brainer. Um, so you can kind of see what we did here. Yeah, yeah, that crit, though, baby. Mmm. Oh yeah, come on to your maker. What? Oh my God, I have to choose a hero. No. <laughs> oh, oh no that's way. Up. Oh, it's the cauldron all over again. No wonder you were bringing that up. Oh, wow. <sighs> Kiss. Shit. Oh, man, we've got... Oh, boy. I don't know who to pick. I feel like we need our healer for the rest of this, but... All right, well... <laughs> We're getting to spare the others. I am ready from our leper, so I guess we're going to send him in. God damn, that's cold, dude. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Oh, oh my, my God. Come on. You, just, oh, you so go good. through all this, and then you just have to give him up. So that was a that was the final boss for the game. We we violated like pretty much every UI UX rule and game design rule with that fight precisely to pay off um, 
cosmic horror, incomprehensible cosmic horror, and the futility of trying to swing a two-handed sword at the heart of the world. Um, you can't beat this, right? Like, how can you beat a Lovecraftian monster? It's absurd. So um, the, the final boss fight is, is like a thematic compression of the entire play experience. There's all the mechanics feature into that fight. It's the entire mission. And, and death and loss are an important part of our game. And so we have to kill you in this fight. Even if you're the best player in the world, you must die in this fight. Um, but the first time you play it, you don't understand what's happening. We, we broke the move flow, and you can see, um, this is from a streamer called Bitterbit. Um, you can see he, he pauses. He's like, I don't understand, because the game completely st stops doing what, it, what they're used to seeing it do. And we did that specifically to create this sense of like dawning horror. It's uncertain what's going on. Suddenly now the player is in the position of the heroes who are in the game. I mean, it's not as bad for the guy in his computer, right? But... You know, it, it aligns their expectations, and suddenly the play field is wide open, and you're just racked with uncertainty. How many more times is he going to do this? Is this a death race? Am I on a timer? All of these questions kind of swim around, and it elevates the intensity of the fight, especially in the, in the final minutes. Truth be told, we built it so you could beat this end fight. Like, we, we want you to, to, to go through this experience, but we want you to go through it um, off balance and, and unsure, and because that's really what our game has, has been about, and we wanted to make that final encounter everything that we'd been building up to. Um, what, yeah, this, so those are some, some examples of how we use creative direction, like, practically throughout the project. What we do is not easy. I mean, you guys know this. There's the hours, there's the pressure, the desire to do great work as creative people, um, not to mention the, <laughs> the crushing self-doubt and financial insecurity, uh, and all the other sort of horrors that like lurk around in, in the dark. Um, but having the confidence that comes from investing early in a strong creative direction for our game and, and understanding it, articulating it, and, and referencing it in every discussion that we possibly could um, it uh, it gave us a lot of a lot of confidence and um, made our journey a lot easier, I think, than it than it could have been otherwise. So we, we got to know our game. We externalized its creative core. We invited it to the meetings. We leveraged its uh, you know its its creative vision to to vet features, to inform decision making, um, and the result was thankfully a high degree of creative consistency. Um, Thematics meshed with art, meshed with sound and audio, and you know Stuart Chatwood and Wayne June and Power Up Audio did a fantastic job on on the audio stuff, and uh, everything is in there for a reason. Everything has uh, a purpose in in our game, and it can be clearly pointed to. And I think that's really important as a, as an indie game. You can't do everything, but what you do do, you have to do it really, really well to stand out. So, <laughs> thanks. I asked him to do like a Brazilian macaw thing to let me know when I was running out of time. <laughs> it was good. It was good. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we, we spent a long time in early access. We were faced with an onslaught of, of fantastic, but oftentimes diametrically opposed feedback. Um, we had our own ideas. We had deadlines. Um, so, you know, for a while there, we were mired in the darkest dungeon of development. But we used our creative direction to sort of illuminate our decision space a little bit and, uh, and keep our party focused on what was important. And ultimately, we, we got out intact. Um, having said that, I still need a few nights at the tavern. But. <laughs> anyway, that's my talk. Thank you very much. So I, I think I timed it okay. I think we got a few minutes for Q&A if anybody wants to say anything. I have a question. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so when you're making a game, you sometimes have to pivot your design because you realize it didn't work as well as you did. When you separate yourself from your creative direction as its own thing, is it still able to pivot or are you like, this is where we have to build now? I think you want to get to the point where you feel confident in it before you jump into development, so you save yourself a pivot later. Obviously, practically, sometimes you've got to make adjustments and changes, but I think that um, when you're talking about creative direction, it can be implemented a number of different ways, and usually when you pivot, you're pivoting on specific features or, or the way it's expressed. Um, so I think you can make strides on articulating a creative direction and still make adjustments to your implementation. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Thanks. Uh, with regards to the kind of metagame in Darkest Dungeon with uh, the characters being disposable, 
Um, yeah. Was that something that was intentionally designed with the same theme of horror and uncertainty and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, of course, because we kind of wanted to subvert this idea that when you start an RPG, like they're all little precious snowflakes that you're going to carry through to the end um, and, and pay off that sort of pulp horror view of, of humanity as being inconsequential. So we layer that in right from the beginning, although you don't actually know that's what we're doing until it's kind of too late and you're getting heart attacked just relentlessly. Um, so so the, the disposability of human life is, um, is part and parcel of, of the whole cosmic horror thing. And um, it's also just sort of a, a really neat exploration in terms of how people play the game. They start out very attached and then they start to lose their heroes, and then they get resentful at the game, so they, they say, well, fine, I'm not going to name anybody. And then they start making way more money, and then they realize they're the villain. Yeah. <laughs> and we didn't do that, it's on you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering, uh, you had mentioned uh, you had that fear of the financial issues and stuff, so I was wondering uh, exactly how did you guys choose where to allocate funds for when you were in development? Um, well, you know, we the first part of our project was all bootstrapped, so we each had our own sort of like personal runways um, that we that we used up, you know, for a while. And Kickstarter was a was a huge, huge help to us. Um, but really, it just went towards cost of living and just and just keeping us fed and keeping the lights on. Um, where we where we broke down our our man hours uh, or our focus um, was was driven a lot by what we felt were the most salient and important things. Sometimes it's not like you can't always work on your top line feature. The other stuff has to get attention too. But you know certainly the the early access release that we brought to market um, a year ago uh, was sort of our best effort at making sure that we put our, our our time and energy on the things that were most important. And then throughout the year we were able to circle back and kind of like raise the quality level and everything else. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I was just curious, how much of the game's mechanics had you prototyped before you felt like your creative direction was totally solid? Um, it's, it's a bit weird, and I can't say that this is going to be entirely transferable, but like Tyler and I would sit down and we talked through and storyboarded most of the game prior to even starting development. It was just the two of us. So when we started, I'm not saying we had every problem solved, but we certainly had a lot of the... The, the, the vision and the core um, idea of how the game would play out and, and what the mechanics kind of looked like. Obviously, there were changes and, and nuances, and we added corpses. That was really fun. And, uh, you know, so things evolved over time as, as they should. Um, but, yeah, it's, uh, we, knew, we knew a lot before we, before we started. Thanks. Uh, sorry, I think he was up. Yeah, he was up. Uh, so most games focus on giving power to the players and make them have a lot of fun and feel good about playing the game. Yeah. Were you prepared for making a game where you were pretty much doing the opposite and maybe making people really upset? Like, just out of curiosity. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> um, we, knew, we knew that we were sort of like walking a bit of a tightrope. Um, to, to be totally honest with you guys, uh, and I guess the internet because it's going to be recorded, but um, <laughs> we we maybe weren't prepared for some of the like uh, the vitriolic responses once you've experienced the party wipe and the level of like lemon juice that goes along with some of those uh, <laughs> some of those comments. Um, but we always felt like we managed to straddle the line and make sure that you were empowered enough to make progress, but that your progress was never uh, guaranteed. And so I grew to sort of disregard feedback that said, you know, I have my level two guys with level two armor fighting a level two monster, I should win. Fundamentally, you should not in our game. That's not a promise that we ever made you. Um, that's just your condition for it, right? Um, but yeah, I think that you know, in some ways, we weren't necessarily prepared for for some of the more colorful responses to that. Uh, 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 thank you for being so uncompromising. <laughs> You're welcome. So obviously, you highlighted the importance of uh, creative direction when it comes to unifying all of the game elements, such as art, design, narrative, and so on, in order to create a cohesive whole. Because uh, because otherwise, if you had one element that kind of stood out of the pack and was an outlier, then obviously it would have been all the more noticeable, and that would have kind of thrown the player off. And uh, regarding you know maintaining that creative direction. Uh, can you name me like any 
particular roadblocks and disagreements you you and your teammates had, had uh, during the development of Darkest Dungeon? Um, the irony of making games is that you don't oftentimes get a lot of time to play them. Um, but I can say that, like, uh, Crypt of the Necrodancer, for instance, I felt like really had the same sort of tight vision, the way the dungeon floor turns into a disco, and, you know, little nods like that, just to keep looping it back around, and, and the beating heart was a great... Um, yeah, they wove, like, sort of this dark fantasy story around this, like, crazy dance game, and I thought they did that really, really masterfully. So that, that was a standout for me as well. All right, interesting. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate your time.